Hey everyone, my name is Matt. Welcome to my shop. I have a special guest here today. This is Scott Grove. Say hi, How you Scott. Doing? Hi, Scott. <laughs> Scott, uh, you're kind of like a veneer expert, I would that's venture a guess. That's what they say. tell me. Yeah, that's what I think. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm a veneer. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Why not? Today, absolutely. So Scott's in town and he was gracious enough to stop by and he's going to do a little veneering demo for us today. It's been kind of interesting for me because I just did a little bit of a little tiny veneering on the tool cabinet doors. So that was my first kind of exposure to doing veneering in this shop, at least, or I guess myself personally doing sure. veneer. So kind of timely. Yeah, yeah. We're trying, to, trying to draw some parallels. That's here. right. That's right. <laughs> so tell us about what what the, what is I've never seen this wood before. So uh, what is this? This is Ferro. So this is veneer. Uh, veneer is great stuff. Uh, it is basically wood cut really thin. Typically, veneer is, is cut sequentially, so the grain is relatively the same, slowly changes through the pack. This one, in fact, has a little sapwood on it here. And we are going to make a radial. So we're going to use the sapwood as an accent or a design pattern by cutting, um, you know, real, by cutting um, triangles, pizza pie. You like pizza? I love pizza. We're going to cut pizza pies, and we're going to make a, what's <laughs> called a, a sunburst or a radial to make a round table. Uh, veneer packs typically come in 24 leaves, and they're labeled, so you know what you, you bought, and if you need more, you can call them up. And a shout out to Certainly Wood, thanks for donating the veneer for this project, so that's good. Crazy stuff. Yeah, yeah, so it's really nice, this is some pretty nice figure. We also have some burled walnut here, but um, I think I'd like to use this because it has a nice contrast between the sapwood and the heartwood. Cool. Okay. So that's that. So the first thing we want to do, typically veneer, is what's called book match. And book match is when you take the leaves and open it like a book, and you mirror the image. So you can get a, you know, mirrored image of of sort of that sapwood. And that's fine and dandy, and you could do that all the way down on a, on a straight table, but you're just going to leave stripes. So I like to kind of mix it up a little more. So what we do is we use mirrors, and you can also use a mirror to see that book match. And if you want to change the book match, you could, by cut, cutting it a different, you know, if you taper the cut, you can sort of see ahead of time of what that, what that book match is going to look like, right? We can also do the same thing by using two mirrors. And depending on how many pieces of veneer you're going to do, we're going to be doing what's called an eight-way match. So when you first get a pack of veneer, it's important that you inspect every sheet because you never know what you're going to get. I mean, usually it should be consistent. So I like to go through. In addition, I want to number each sheet as I go through because if I'm playing with this, I might get them out of order. And it's important to keep them in sequence. So as I'm going through here, these all look kind of good. Uh, some observations. Oh, here you go. So this is a perfect example. So this I would actually call a shim sheet where it's really thin and broken apart. So this is actually extra thin, which means the knife skipped or didn't go advance far enough when it was cutting, which besides being this one thin, the one before or after is going to be extra thick. So not only discarding this one, I'm going to have to determine which one is thicker and it would be this one. I can just do it by feel. So these two, one's too thin, one's too thick. Oh, and look at this, we got another one, but that's not too bad. I'm going to be working down here, so I can continue numbering. Five, six, ten, and so on. So we're going to be doing a, an eight-way match, or a, an eight-piece an eight pie, yep. if you will. Uh, so if you take 360 degrees divided by eight, you get... 45! Yes! <laughs> so. Um, to help visualize, we're going to use mirrors to, to see the pattern. So like the most I, like scary bar fight yeah, mirror ever. Yeah, so we're going to set uh, dividers or get a triangle at 45 degrees. I've done that. I set this in here. Now I have a general idea of, of 45 degree mirrors and I can move this around to see my pattern. And then I'm going to go in here and draw that 45 degree wedge. Okay. We have a rough layout, so now I use a template that's 45 degrees or a little more, and I'll explain a little more about that later. And I want to lay this in and mark my, mark my layout exactly. The other thing I'm concerned about 
is this grain lining up. And if you can see, if I just assume this stack, see the grain here? There's a major shift in this grain. And that means that my point here is, is not going to transfer all the way through. So I want to line up all this grain right so now we've got a more consistent line and I'll do this on the other end also there's a number of ways of cutting veneer in this case we're going to gang cut them all together when you gang cut it's really important that you compress all the sheets of veneer together tightly you can do that uh, with C clamps or, or, or clamping to the ceiling. What we're doing, this is actually an old school method where you're actually using clamps. You could use just two by fours and wedge them to the ceiling. But in any event, you want to be sure this is, becomes a sort of single piece of veneer. I'm also using uh, just a simple X-Acto knife. You could use a veneer saw. You could clamp this together and cut it on a table saw if you wanted to. So there's a whole variety of ways. So I'm going to just simply score this and you want to start light take it I like to sand the edge just take any fuzz off look at that this is our first cut wunderbar and they're all right on the line so now we're actually going to cut these individually by hand to show you how that's done. What I've done is I double stuck a straight edge here. I can line my veneer right up against that. I can also use this corner to be sure that I'm right on my tip of my sapwood right there. I can take my triangle, which is 45 degrees or more. You do not want to be less than 45 degrees. It's better to be, say, a half a degree over. So I'm going to line this up, slide my template and I'm left-handed but I'm using my right hand to cut and again I'm gonna make a very fine score first and for what it's worth I like to use MDF for my templates not scrap plywood from that backyard Backyard plywood. The backyard plywood. And you can tell when this thing releases, but you don't want to force it. So that looks pretty good right there. And there is our first pie shape. Pizza pie just for you. Oh, extra big crust. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So here's our match, and one thing you want to be aware of is between individual leaves, the grain slowly changes. Now, I have um, matching grain here, so this is a book match between two and three, and so this, this seam lines up perfectly. Here, since I have sapwood, there isn't any sort of relationship that crosses over, so I'm not worried about that. But as I work around, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I have eight and one which are very far apart. So if I look at this match, if you can see, this little shape here is, doesn't mirror across. So that's something you want to be aware of. And what I will do is I'll reconfigure these to mix up the match and evenly space these out. So here I've rearranged the leaves to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can see the mirrors are all slightly off but they're more consistent. So I want a consistent mismatch, if that makes sense. And there's no right or wrong way of doing this. It's really up, up to you and what looks good. Uh, I can go one, two, three, four, five, six, and just have fun with it and see what works for you. Okay, so now we just simply tape this together. I like to use veneer tape, which is a glue-based tape. But Matt doesn't have that here. But Matt doesn't have it here. So you can use, and you, for smaller projects, you can use painter's tape. You do not want to use masking tape because that will, that will be very difficult to peel off after you press it. And I'll just kind of work my way around. And you want to glue these up 
in the two halves. So I'm going to glue these four and those four, and then we're going to talk about how we make this center seam line up. So, so you want to glue each half at a time. Point being is that if your template, you want your template to be 45 degrees or a little over. And what that does is makes this not a straight line. So if I put this together, you can see here how this is just a little more than 180 degrees. It might be 180 and 182 degrees, which is perfect. So now to make this a perfect alignment, I can take a straight edge and cut that and everything will line up just perfect. Let's do that. The crowd goes crazy. <sighs> okay, we're ready to press this now. We're going to be using a vacuum bag. If you don't know about a vacuum bag, Google it. Uh, it's really the way to go. It rolls up and stores away, and it uses a vacuum pump and creates pressure on both sides. Really great way to go for veneering. Here, we're going to veneer both sides of our core at the same time. So I have my good face down. I'm going to be using my core. And what's very important is you always want to veneer both sides of the core. It's called a balanced panel. So we're going to be using a piece of veneer that Matt cut and seamed. Ooh, and the crowd goes crazy. And that will go on top. So we're veneering both sides at the same time. And lastly, you want to have a flat table. And on top, you don't want to rely on just the bag. You need a platen or something to go on top to keep everything flat. So the glue, I like to use tight bond, and this is a cold press for veneering. They also make a, a extended. Uh, it's important to use a v specific glue for veneer because it has a longer open time. Do not use yellow glue on larger projects. Maybe for a small box is okay, but I like to use white glue because it has a long open time. Or if you're on a wet environment, you want to use urea formaldehyde, uh, like Unibond 800. But we're using the tight bond glue. And that's really good stuff. What about contact cement? Do not ever use contact cement. Yeah, contact cement is a rubber-based glue. It never gets hard. And as the veneer expands and contracts, it will bubble. Trust me, I make a lot of money fixing a veneer that has been glued on with rubber cement. Or keep or, doing or, it so I keep making money. Yeah, or contact cement. So yeah, that's, that's a misnomer. Side note, the only time you can is if you buy the veneer that's pressed on a phenolic back that has stabilized the veneer, and then you can use that for, say, kitchen cabinet sides, something like that, but you can't use raw veneer. A nice even coat is really important. The number one cause of veneer failure is uh, glaze, glue glaze, meaning taking too much time putting the glue on and waiting and not getting in the press and uh, not enough glue. And then a second cause is too much glue. Too much glue will add too much moisture and then the veneer will want to bubble and has to move and it can't go anywhere. So, ooh, Jackson Pollock. Bam. Here we go. This thing is so cool. Oh, yeah. Good. So let's, let's take a look. Okay. It's, it's still in there. Yeah, it's still good. This is the one, this is your side. This is the one that you did. <laughs> look at that. That looks like wood. Now, one thing I recommend is you want to take the, if you're using masking tape, you want to peel the masking tape off as soon as possible. If you leave it on there, uh, especially in a press, if you leave it in the press overnight, mm -hmm. actually I pull it out and take the masking tape off in an hour and put it back okay. in the press. But uh, you can take it out in an hour and you're good. And man, look at that scene. That's... Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, wait. Mm. Mm. No, just kidding. <laughs> you got me that time. Yeah, huh? Ooh, ah. And the wax paper or um, newspaper will prevent any bleed through from sticking to your core. That's really important that you want that. But help me peel this Sticking off. Let's plan. take a look. Yes. You want to stick to your core. That I'm sorry. Yes. So <laughs> the wax, the wax paper. So the wax. So the wax paper uh, between your platen and your veneer prevents your veneer. 
prevents any bleed through of glue sticking to your platen. Yep, there you go. <laughs> oh, wow. Wait, what was that? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. There you go. Huh? Yeah. Right? Not bad. Nice. And he helped. I did a little bit. <laughs> this is uh, actually, it's really cool to see this in person and see it kind of real time because yeah. it's not that hard. I mean, there's a lot of like minutia here and there yeah. along the way. There's a lot of tricks of the trade, but it's it's not that intimidating. It's pretty easy to do. No, and look at the pattern you can get just by a little bit of work and just a little bit of, you know, knife and a straight edge, really. That's it. And you have this really cool radial pattern that yeah. has this, especially this kind of flipping around thing. Yeah, now you have. Yeah. Kind of a, a star pattern Ooh, or like an X or whatever. Right, right. So this is opening my eyes a whole nother uh -huh. world of possibilities. Have I converted you? I mean, I'm getting there. <laughs> I mean, unless I can find a tree that grows this way, <laughs> yeah. I can cut a slab out of it. Well, now you can cut your own, when you cut your own veneer, you can, you can, yeah, you right. can, you can do this. So. I can. Awesome. So I'm going to do something with this in a little bit, but Scott's got to go and I just want to say a big thank you for taking oh, time out of your oh day man. and come thank by you. and no, hang out in the fun. shop it's and do a little hearing. It's been great. And uh, again, thanks again for, for tolerating me uh, and everything. So uh, <laughs> that's been really fun. So. so make sure you check out Scott's stuff. I'll leave you links to all his things in the description. He's got books, he's got videos, he's got uh, in-person classes where he goes places and teaches yeah. you stuff yeah. and, uh, and stuff like that. So I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i see you in a little bit. We're going to do something with this. I don't know what yet. We'll do we'll something. We'll see. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> so to get ready to cut this thing into a circle, I'm going to transfer the center of the radio pattern to the back side because that's where I'm going to mount the trammel, which is going to guide the router into a circle. I'm using a drill bit as a pivot point, so I'll drill a shallow hole right at that mark. I'm using Scott's ultimate router base in trammel mode. So I'm just gonna line things up and get that drill bit into the hole, which is drilled into this top. I have the radius set to a little bit bigger than I want. That way I can make a roughing pass, then move the radius in a little bit, and then make a cleanup pass. So with this thing all set up, all I have to do is plunge into the work and start working my way around into a circle until I've cut all the way through this thing. So even though I was trying to position these bench cookies so I wouldn't hit them, I still hit this one. Oh, come back. It's, uh, it's pretty chewed up. <laughs> it's all good. All right, let's take a look. That's cool. Check that out. <laughs> the circle. <laughs> so you can see there is a little discrepancy. Where is it? On this edge here. Just the way I was kind of feeding it, there was a hump on the outside here that kept hitting on the uh, the base plate. So that's why I do a rough cut and then I'll come back in here and do a cleanup cut so I can move the a little pivot pin in just a little bit, about a uh, sixteenth of an inch, and then do one cleanup pass and we should be good to go. So let's run through the process of adding a solid wood edge to this thing. Using a half inch diameter pattern bit, I'll route around the radial veneer tabletop, or whatever this might be, to create a template that's a half inch bigger. The most important thing here is to keep the router bit bearing pressed against the workpiece. As I'm going around, I'm pulling on the router base handle to keep it tight to the workpiece. The outer perimeter is over after, so if the bit pulls away, we'll gouge the reference area of our template. I'll just go around once so I don't risk the bit wandering on multiple passes. The remaining waste can be cut away with a jigsaw and then flush trimmed. With that template ready, I can start working on the edging stock, which we made up of segments. I'm going with a six segment ring just to shake things up a bit since the real veneer is eight segments.
I'll assemble the ring in two halves so I'll cut some clamping areas into the waist area near the corner and get those assembled. Once the glue sets, the segments can be screwed to the template. This one inch diameter disc comes with Scott's router base and makes it easy to draw the cut path of the router. Using this disc, we can draw a cut line and remove the bulk of the waste before the actual routing. Both the half rings are trimmed and reattached to the template, and now we can route them perfectly to match the veneer thing. <laughs> this is a half inch router bit and an inch and a half guide bushing. The offset between the bearing and the edge of the router bit is a half inch, exactly how much bigger a template is than the veneered circle. How's that for some mathematical magic? <laughs> And all we have to do now is route around the template with the bushing riding along the template. I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> So you can see here I have a witness line on the veneer piece and I also have a witness line out here on the edging because this is uh, made by me and I'm not perfect so I'm doubting this has a perfect concentricity so this will keep it all aligned. So if you had it for here for instance, it doesn't fit nearly as well as a little bit of a gap right here but turning it back to where that witness line is supposed to go, it all fits perfectly. So the edging has the exact same profile as the inner veneer field. Uh, taking into account all of my uh, variability in my routing skills getting this thing perfectly round. So I've cut the little clamping tab things onto the two halves. So let's go ahead and glue the two halves together and glue it to the field as well. The glue is all set up on this thing so I'll get it out of the clamps and cut the banding to final size. I'm going for a half inch wide band, so I use a compass to roughly mark the width and trim it at the bandsaw. Then it's back to using the trammel with the same center point in the veneer to trim the banding to final size. I'll again do a roughing pass in a couple of steps and then a cleanup pass with the trammel radius reduced just a bit. So there is your radial veneer or sunburst pattern veneer with a solid wood segmented edge band. That is uh, pretty darn cool. Now the process for actually inlaying or I guess cutting the banding to match the shape of the field, in this case it happens to be a circle, is the exact same process you'd use to inlay any shape into anything. So this is exactly the same process that I showed in my class on waterfall tables where we did a glass inlay in one of the tabletops. It's all about using the mathematical magic of those offsets in your router bits as well as your guide bushings. Now on my little demo piece here, the one thing that kind of went wrong is I should have used a band clamp or a ratchet strap to glue the banding on here. Uh, the clamping strategy I had didn't quite work out as well as I had hoped. There is a decent amount of gapping here between the field and the, uh, the edging which uh, isn't a huge deal, I'm not too torn up about it because it's just a sample demo piece. But on the bright side, it does allow me to potentially show a technique in the future. A way to mask that is just to put an inlay around the border there, right at that seam, and you'll never know it's there. So, <laughs> if you want more information on doing crazy stuff like this, you can check out Scott's book. The process of doing uh, any kind of hardwood edging on any shape whatsoever, it goes to that process in here along with uh, some really crazy stuff. If, if you take a look at the sample picture on the book, you can see the crazy shape and all the things that are going on within this actual project. So this book is quite useful. Now this was a fairly simple example of just being a circle. So you CNC guys are probably laughing right now because it's like the easiest thing in the world to do this on a CNC. And they say CNCs aren't woodworking. I would have loved to do this on a CNC. That would have saved me a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> and the process would have been exactly the same. <laughs> so hopefully this demystified the veneering process a little bit. Definitely check out Scott's stuff, check out his channel, and uh, yeah, he knows a lot about veneer 
and he's got some great content. He's a fun dude to talk to and hang out with. So definitely check that out. I will leave you links to everything down in the description. So thank you as always for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments on veneering, maybe I'll know the answer to them if not Scott does. <laughs> but please feel free to leave me a comment down below. Be happy to try and answer any of those questions you might have. And until next time, happy woodworking.